<laughs> After trying to write my review of this game for a couple of months, I've decided to take a step back and try something a little bit different. I have a great deal to say about the game, but I also can't seem to put it into a scripted thought, so I'm going to try this unscripted for the first time ever, and I'll edit it down afterwards. With that said, this week we are discovering another recommended game, or requested game, this time from our very own Lag Fairy. It is Lisa the Painful RPG, as well as Lisa the Joyful. I greatly enjoyed a lot about Lisa the Painful, but it also had some very, very, very severe issues that made me feel like this was a perfect example of a developer with great ideas, with great ability, who needed someone else who could step in and say, no, okay, you've overstepped a bit here, we get what you were going for, but you need to back it up a little bit. So much of the game is great. A lot of the soundtrack hits this perfect note. The characters, it was never a character that I didn't want to talk to in this whole game. For a whole RPG, that's insane to just have a whole game where I'm like, yeah, I want to talk to that character and this character. How many, R how many characters in the last RPG you played did you want to talk to? How many did you walk past and you never talked to them because, uh, it's going to be another generic NPC that's going to say, I don't know, I love shorts. They're comfy to wear. No, actually, he was enjoyable. Um, top of the morning to you. I only talk to sailors, essentially. And in this game, every NPC had something interesting to say, something cool about them, something that set them apart, and oftentimes something that set up for something you could do in the story. That made this so much fun. I guess I should explain the um, actual story there was The Flash. No one knows what The Flash was, but after The Flash happened, all of the women in the world disappeared. And the world is now populated in an apocalyptic wasteland by a bunch of horny, lonely men who are gay now. Everybody's gay whether they like it or not. Even if they're straight, they have to be gay. And humanity is going to die out because, you know, there's no more women. You are a former martial artist who is living in the apocalypse. Uh, you have a drug issue. You've ha always had a drug issue. We have no idea why you have a drug issue. So that's part of my first problem with the game, but I'll get to that in one second after I explain the story. You find the last remaining girl. You find a little child. And her name is Buddy, or you name her Buddy, and you raise her and you take care of her. And there's a lot of scenes that are really sweet with you and your group of three friends taking care of this little girl and her painting you up in all kinds of makeup. It's adorable. It's very sweet. You genuinely feel throughout this game. And the creator clearly intended for you to feel. It's very well crafted, except for where it's not. So like I said, you do not know anything in this game. I got into arguments constantly with uh, Sarah, the Lag Fairy, because she said there was so much going on in this game, and this was going on, and that was going on. No, it wasn't. Uh, maybe it was brought up in Lisa the First. In fact, as far as I understand, it was. But that's not a good sign when I have to play a game that I never, ever, ever heard of in order to play this game. On top of which, it's never provided for me in any way or place to get it. It's not purchasable. The only place I've found to get it is in a RPGmaker.net game download. So it's free, that's great, but... <laughs> you need to put it in here somewhere if it's going to be that integral to the story, because otherwise, who is the girl that I keep seeing who's hung up by her neck? I get that the fat dude in the Hawaiian shirt is my dad, but it's never made clear. So, okay, apparently the story is that you're Brad, you had a sister named Lisa, which is where this name Lisa all keeps coming from, and your dad was abusive physically, mentally, and sexually to her, and you were a horrible, horrible, horrible person, and you failed her and she killed herself. 
but only after... Well, I'll get into that in a second. I went into it knowing she was dead because Sarah couldn't keep herself from telling me that. So that's part of why you're trying so hard to take care of Buddy was because you failed Lisa. But that's never in any way expressed at all. At all. At all. And when she's... Looks like she's about 14, 15, probably 13 or younger. I don't think they ever give her an age. Uh, people find out about her because your three friends don't keep their mouths shut because she, they need her to repopulate the world. She is the last woman. She is the last person capable of having children. And you're like, no, uh, she is my buddy. And I'm not going to force her to have sex with a whole bunch of crazy pervert men that the world has turned into. So you have to fight your way to catch up with her and save her from these men. And the longer the story goes on, the more clear it is that by doing this, you're dooming the world. You're not saving anyone. You're not doing anything. You're actively dooming the world by doing this. And that they're right. She does need to have kids if humanity is going to continue. And you don't care. And the game tries to pull that thing that I hate where it goes, oh yes, you don't care, naughty player, waggle that finger. I don't have a choice in this matter. Similarly to when I played L.A. Noir, I didn't have a choice to cheat on my wife. If you had asked me if I wanted to cheat on my wife with the dead-eyed creepy lady, no. Keep her the hell away from me. Would you like to destroy the world and keep Buddy pushed down and locked in a cellar, basically? No maybe curate the people that see her and let her pick her sexual partners Tr teach her you know there's a middle ground here that the game completely ignores and then it wags its finger at you for ignoring that middle ground not even for ignoring that middle ground it never presents that middle ground it either presents that you're going to lock buddy in the basement forever or she's gonna have a train run on her and it presents having a train run on a 13 year old as the good solution and you're holding society back by not letting that happen phrases i didn't think i would say when i woke up this morning but that is somewhat to be expected because part of what i loved about this game is the dark sense of humor oh oh my god the sense of humor that runs throughout the whole thing like okay my main team by the end perfectly displays some of this sense of humor and some of the people i never used on my main team like, uh, there's a person you meet, and he's just standing there, and he's crouching to poop, and his spider runs up and pokes his butthole. <laughs> and you have to save him, by which I mean, step on the one health spider. And he joins your team, and I'm like, no, dude, that's okay. I don't want you, <laughs> but too bad I get him anyway. <laughs> oh, but my main team is made up of Nern. He's this old guy, you just find him sitting around and like every other NPC, I talk to him because I can, I can talk to him because it's interesting to talk to him. And he just starts talking about this story of his wife and him going to a dinner before the flash and he remembers this when he drinks his sweet tea and why did his neighbor have such a beautiful wife? Why couldn't he have that wife? Why was he stuck with his old cow of a wife and his neighbor got to have sex with his beautiful wife and he hated that neighbor. That neighbor was horrible and his wife kept nagging him and then they were leaving and there was the flash of light and his wife was gone and ha, now neither of us have wives. I miss my wife, except I don't miss that old cow. I miss his wife. By the way I want to join you <laughs> and he doesn't even join you right away he joins you when you keep talking to him and you keep hearing the story I think you have to talk to him something like three or four times and keep listening to this story but this story is so dementedly strange and funny that you want to hear it you want to keep listening to this story and then uh, my next one Olin uh, I'm in a bar uh, near the beginning of the game and I talk to everyone in the bar because I'm talking to everyone at this point. I actually, I always kept talking to everyone. I already said that, but I'm talking to them. And I talked to this one person and he's like, yeah, I'll work for you for like 115 mags, which I was slightly sure was more mags than existed in this world. Yeah. Um, and a, the currency in this game is magazines, dirty magazines called mags, because in a world where everything is falling apart and there are no women, 
that's the only women left is these magazines. So apparently they became the currency. I don't know. But he wanted like 115 mags. And I thought that was slightly more mags than existed in the world at that point. So I talked to the next guy and he's like, I'll fight, I'll fight for you for 600 mags. Oh, I'm, I'm certain that's more mags than exist in this world. Okay, no, you're out. And I talked to uh, Olin and he was like, Oh man, I don't even care about Max. Can you just buy me a drink? And oh my, ooh, I connect to this person. I like this person. Here is your drink, good sir. It only costs six mags. I can do six mags. By the way, who are you? Nice drink. Good meeting you. I'm gonna work for you now. Oh, amazing. What do you do? Massive amounts of damage. I do massive amounts of damage. I like you. And then finally, uh, for a long time, I had a different party member, but at, towards the end of the game, I find this artist and he's Garth. He's standing in the middle of this cavern, surrounded by his own drawings, wearing a blanket as a cape. So Garth joins you out of nowhere. You give him mags as inspiration. Then he's like, I'm joining you now. It's so much fun being in this world, immersing yourself in this world, except when it's not because sometimes all of the immersion, all of the choices you have to make don't matter. Um, and sometimes the director just made decisions that really didn't work. So for instance, he likes to give you hard choices. Like early on in the game, pick one, your healer or your arm. Remember, you're a martial artist. You need your arm to do damage. So which is it gonna be? Do you want them to kill your healer or cut off your arm? And because these characters are so vibrant and so interesting, you've attached yourself to them. I gave up my arm or your, uh, your team or your items. Do you let them, do you let them cut off buddy's nipple or do you let them kill your team? And at this point, you've got other allies. You've got other options. And it sounds obvious from the outside. Oh yeah, I won't let my team die, it's just a nipple. But when you do it, mm, you feel so guilty. And they just keep doing this. You make these decisions, like you make the decision between the nipple and the team. And then immediately you have to make a decision again between the team again and your other arm. And I get what he was going for. You know what? No, it's not over yet. You're still suffering. But here's the thing. It makes my first decision feel completely nullified. It makes it feel like my first decision didn't actually matter. Because... <laughs> cool, you... Nah, it's not good enough. I'm gonna kill him again. Or especially after I give up my arm the first time. I want to keep my team. I've gone through hell to keep my team safe and alive. I give up my items to keep them alive. And then I have to go play Russian Roulette. Literally play Russian Roulette with my team. Here's who's gonna play Russian Roulette. Hope they don't off themselves. Ah oh, shit, they off themselves. Ah oh, shit, they off themselves too. Ah oh, shit, I'm down to like one person left. And it will just keep going. That is not, no. I get what you were trying to do. You're trying to display this world that is fallen into horrible disrepair, that's falling apart at the seams, that's dropped into insanity. But this doesn't work. It makes it feel like, as the player, I'm just being dicked around. It makes it feel like nothing I'm doing matters. And I get that there's so many characters that I can gain, but you have to keep leveling them up. You have to keep interacting with them. So losing characters constantly and bleeding characters does not work, especially if you're going to make it so that I have to sacrifice my arms or lose the characters because I can't do this on my own. The game is not built for that, especially when every enemy has so much health. Oh my God, that's why I kept Garth on my team because his basic attack could poison and I'd be fighting these monsters the joy monsters there's a drug in the game called joy where it, it takes away all your negative feelings it doesn't make you happy but it makes you you know relaxed and calm it's it's kind of like a substitute for being happy in a world where no one's happy anymore but if you eat it it mutates you into this horrible horrible looking monster and i'm fighting these joy mutants and I'll deal them damage in a turn, and I'll deal them like 600 damage. And poison does damage based on their maximum health. So I'll hit them with a poison tick, 
and it'll hit them for over a thousand, two thousand damage. And I'm sitting here going, why? Why does it have this much health? Fights drag out in this game to a point where they're not even fun anymore. They just drag at you in boredom. And you'll go through the game and you'll just want the fights to stop. The fights are very creative and he had a lot of great ideas and situations and characters. And those make the fights fun. But then you're in the fight and it's dragging on for the hundredth time. And you can't grind, really, because of how the save and heal system works. Okay, so, oh my god. The save system. At first, I really liked it. So you save by talking to the crows, but that doesn't heal you. In order to heal, you sleep at a campfire. Any campfire. But when you sleep at a campfire... Uh, basically a random number generator goes off in the background and something happens to you. And it could be you wake up, you're fine. It could be that um, you wake up and someone stole a piece of your equipment. Uh, I had one instance where I woke up, a man is standing over me, he turns around, drops his pants, farts on my face, and runs away. Then again, I had another instance where I got up, a man ran up to me, clubbed me in the face with what looked like a cricket bat, and permanently gave my character a scar and decreased his stats. Sometimes, a lot of times, a spider will uh, come out from under you after, as you're waking up and will crawl away and you'll all be poisoned, which is wonderful. I may as well have not gone to sleep in the first place. Why did I bother going to sleep? Now I'm poisoned. I may as well just go back to sleep because that's the only way to heal and the poison is going to drop me back way under the point of healing unless I want to spend all of my mags on health items. And the answer to that might be, oh, well, that's, uh, that's what you have other characters for in case they die and it's permanent. Yeah, that's great. I need mags to get the other characters. Almost every other character in the game requires mags to obtain them, but if I'm spending all my mags on healing items in order to not use the healing spot, which always, always, 99.9% .9 of the time dicks you over, the worst one is when the heal spots just say, you lose a character. If you're lucky, someone will kidnap your character and you're going to have to wander back to the beginning area of the game to go find where they've been taken. If you're unlucky, the character just left in the middle of the night, no matter how good you were treating them, no matter how much you were doing with them, they just left. There's all the mags you spent on them. <whistles> Down the drain. I get that it's an apocalyptic world. But in a game that requires your allies so heavily, in a game where if I had not had the team that I did, I genuinely don't think I could have finished the game because of some of the enemies that you were throwing at me. Terry can heal, but he's a shit healer. You need Nern. You need the infinite resource spamming that Nern can do. And even then, I'm not sure that was the intended way to beat it. I don't know what the intended way was. I just had Nern spamming infinite resources. So in that kind of scenario, you've taken it a bridge too far. You've taken it from this is this way because I'm trying to show you the world to f you the player for playing my game. There is a level and you've past that line. He needed someone else there to tell him that, to reel him in a little bit. And the other big problem with it was the story. I don't know who any of these people are. We see a couple kids in flashbacks and I could try to infer who those kids are, but you don't know, especially because a lot of them wear masks. The way I thought everything was working when it ended was I wasn't 100% clear on what Lisa had to do with any of this. And I didn't understand who Buzzo was. Oh, he was like the head of one of the gangs. He was the person that kept taking your arm. I'm like, why? Why do you hate me? Who are you? What is going on? And I thought he was one of like the bullies that uh, we saw in one of the flashbacks. I thought he was one of the bullies and then the two other people that were with him originally that you defeat were writing something else. I don't know. And when I finished and I tried to express a lot of this to Sarah, she was like, oh, you didn't explore enough. That's why you didn't see any of this. No, it turns out I didn't see any of this because some of it is found in the original. Some of it was only found as text through data mining. The rest of it 
is not not stated is inferred from the endings of Lisa the Joyful. So it turns out that Buzzo actually was in love with Lisa and that his nickname was Buzzo because she manipulated him into mutilating animals and killing them with a buzzsaw and built him up to the point where he'd do it to her because she thought if she was no longer beautiful, then her dad would stop molesting her. That's very sad, it's very touching. Except for the fact that it was never actually expressed until the ending of. It might have happened in Lisa the First. I don't know. I haven't played Lisa the First, and I've already expressed how I feel about the concept that I would have to play Lisa the First to understand any of this when Lisa the First is not an actively available game. And that's why he hates you, because he loved your sister and he feels that you let her down, and it is implied again in Lisa the Joyful that you participated at one point under the coercion slash force of your father being drunk. I don't know. Um, there's a lot that gets inferred in Lisa the Joyful, and that was the excuse that it felt like everyone held up. Well, it gets explained in Lisa the Joyful. Well, it is found out in Lisa the Joyful, and that's the sequel. Except it's not a sequel. You know what Lisa the Joyful is? It's a stretch goal from the original Kickstarter for Lisa the Painful. This was never meant to be part of it. This was something that he would only make if people stumped up $10,000. The original goal was $7,000, and only if people stumped up an extra $3,000, basically an extra half of this development, he would make and release the game that explains everything, that makes anything that happened make sense. On top of which, the whole entire Kickstarter appears to have been horribly managed. The message board is full of people who never got their goals actually met. The things that they donated for were never provided to them. Never see any response to them. You never see any update. You just see people, hey, check your messages. Hey, is anyone looking at messages? I never got my stuff. And the game has been made. And we pledged over double your goal. And it appears you basically walked off with it. Even more insulting, the goal number two was the beach resort. You know what's in the beach resort? Jack, absolutely Jack is in the beach resort. It's a meaningless place. He took 2,000 extra dollars to make a map with basically no meaning or nothing that couldn't be inferred from things that already existed in the game or some things that he claimed were being inferred and in actuality had no meaning until they got explained in Lisa the Joyful. And then Lisa the Joyful. Towards the end of Lisa the Painful, you give up everything, everything is falling apart, Lisa expresses that she agrees with everyone else, and that the best way to save humanity is to go have a train run. And you refuse to accept that and keep trying to follow and chase her. And even in these moments, there's some of the darkest, funniest humor in the game. There's also some very frustrating things. There's so many little things that are frustrating throughout the game that I can't even think to begin to explain them, but I'll pick one. You get in the boat, and you have to drag, take this boat to find her. And you travel, 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 and you do not stop traveling. You keep going and going for scream after scream, and it stops being funny. It stops being a joke. It stops being anything but monotonous and boring. One of my biggest phrases was, Jesus Christ, this guy has a hard-on for doing everything as slowly as possible. You drag yourself slowly across the ground and you have to watch every moment of it. You have to walk slowly through this area. In order to find the secret developer area, you just climb and climb and climb for like two straight minutes to get a giant middle finger and they refuse to let you kill yourself so you have to walk back down. He has some kind kind of throbbing erection for forcing you to do things in the slowest way possible. It's not fun. It's not engaging. It's boring. You have made your game boring. There is only so much of our attention that can be sustained through your wit and your humor. And I love your humor. I love the world you've built. But when you drag me out of it by literally dragging me along through these fights that take upwards of five minutes each, 
through just watching myself drag myself across the screen, through backtracking through a section for the hundredth time, just walking along the same area again, through walking my way through 17 screens worth of cave. I don't care anymore. You've taken all of that caring, all of that world that you've built up, and you've pissed it away on your own little fetish for moving slowly. But so, you get there, she steals your boat. It's the almost the lowest point of the game. So what do you do? You murdered the boatman earlier in order to prevent him from having his way with her. And you use his floating obese body as the boat. That's hilarious. It's amazing. I was laughing. And then I had to travel another five screens so slowly. And after two screens, it wasn't funny anymore again. And then you have to kill your team and fight the final boss. And then none of it matters because Buddy leaves anyway. It is so poignant, so intense. You ask Buddy to hold you and it's a very real moment and the game ends on a very real moment, but then it never answers anything. So instead you get to pick up in Lisa the Joyful where now you're Lisa and one of the people who formerly studied under Brad is trying to help you and it turns out he's your older brother because he was Brad's adopted son and Lisa's had enough of all of this of being controlled and instead she murders everyone. She murders pacifists. She murders actual bad people. She murders everyone else that is in charge so that she can stand over the wasteland. But by the time she's standing over the wasteland, there's no wasteland to stand over. There's no one really left. And she's abandoned Rando. She's abandoned everyone else. The game started out so strong and in every way it was vastly superior. And then you get towards three quarters of the way through the game and I couldn't fight anything. I couldn't win. And I felt like that if I could just keep smashing my head against a brick wall until I got lucky enough to gain one more level, then that would be all I needed. And I was right, because that one more level gave me a heal. And suddenly, every fight, oh my god, I thought they were a grind in Lisa the Painful. From that point on, every fight in Lisa the Joyful becomes, as long as I use my ability to heal and don't play it stupidly, they can never kill me. So it is merely a matter of time uh, for how long I kill them. And fights drag on. And on. And on. And on. It is so slow and so painfully miserable that you just never want to fight anything again and you just want the game to be over. And then you find the scientist that created joy in order to rule the world with his joy monsters and it's inferred that he's your father and that he murdered your mother who was the only other woman and then you kill him and it acts like this is some big revelation and big thing but it doesn't feel like it is it doesn't feel like anything the the rape scene felt more like something earlier that felt like your climactic moment and instead it just ends on this idiot with a trumpet and then depending on everything you've done, you get one of several endings. At the end of this hours long RPG, you get one of several endings that actually have nothing to do with anything and have nothing to do with your choices. It's just different choices that you made decide which glimpse into the past you get to see in order to unlock information that was hidden from you that actually makes a difference to the previous game. To a degree. I can understand why you did that. To a degree, I can understand what you were going for. But it is a beautiful example of a wonderfully, incredibly creative developer who needed someone else to step in and edit their work. Who needed someone else to step in 
and say when they needed to back off a little bit, when they were making things too unnecessarily complicated. And I can be guilty of this a lot of times. I'm a writer, I've tried developing RPG Maker games, and every time I was too complicated, I was too wrapped up in how clever I was. Did I have great ideas looking back? Yes, I had some great ideas. But there was no one to step up and say, hey, Otter, cool idea, but have you ever considered you're stupid? No one had ever been there to do that. And that was what I needed. And I really think that's what this game needed, was someone to step up and go, yes, great idea, but you have crossed the line here. Yes, great idea. Now, how about you ever present that idea instead of either never presenting it and like mentioning it in a tweet, or worst of all, letting your audience decide the secrets in the background of your game for you. Letting them come forward on Twitter and say, well, here's what I think, and going, yes, good idea. That's definitely what I intended. You know what? No one believes that. If you intended it, put it in yourself. Overall, I found Lisa the Painful to be a fascinating experience, but there was so many issues with it that I could only play for so long before I had to set it aside because I was becoming irrationally angry. And it wasn't because the world was tough. It wasn't because this was tough or that was tough. And I know that's what the developer would want to say. Oh, well, it's a difficult world. That's not why. You were the problem. Your inability to put together this world in a way that worked was a problem. You have all this information in your head, I can see it, and you've got so much creativity but you never brought some of it forward or you put too much of it forward and you cross that line too many times. I usually save this for the absolute end, but together, as a pair, Lisa the Painful and Lisa the Joyful is a seven. I give a lot of games a 7, but it is a 7. It is a good game with great humor, great characters, great settings, some actually good puzzles. It is a good RPG. Together they're a 7, but it's only together that they're a 7. Separated, the flaws in the painful are so great that it's a 6, and barely a 6 at that. It might even be a 5. If you're not ready to save scum, don't waste your time. On the flip side of that, Lisa the Joyful is an 8, being held back when combined with the Painful for a 7. It has all the depth. It has most of the nuance. But there is depth and nuance in the other one. There are moments that'll really make you feel, and when you have to make the tough decisions, you really will get up inside yourself and sweat. And it, when it's done right, it's perfectly done. He just needed to step back and not ruin other parts of it. So I suppose that's my final analysis. Lisa the Painful, a 6 out of 10. Amazing, but marred. Deeply, deeply marred. Lisa the Joyful, 8 out of 10. With the uh, amazing first half, a genuinely terrifying character with motivations you can understand and feel with decisions and situations that will wrench at your heart, but with an incredibly boring final quarter as combat drags to a standstill. And when combined together, a seven. Great games that overall I would recommend, but highly flawed and must be played together. Hopefully that was what you wanted, uh, Sarah, because other than that, ugh, sorry. Only so much I can say. See you guys next fortnight. I don't know what's going on, but I like it. Ha 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 
That's awesome. I want to love the world you built.